welcome to the last talk for you, this RubyConf, unfortunately. I um, hope you do enjoy the conference so far. Did you? Did you? No? No? Raise your hands. More fun, I know. I know. Uh, you're a bit tired, and the, the talk is going to be a little bit technical. Uh, so that's the last one for today. So I hope we pass through it successfully. So the talk is called uh, "High Speed Cables for Ruby." Probably not so clear title. Maybe we should call it "Cables at Tiffany's," which is actually explains what we're doing right now here. And we literally had some cables problem right now. Uh, as I understand, we do not have a live recording of this slide, so well, they're gonna be kind of uh, combined later from the PDF, okay. So I'd like to start with explaining what I'm going to talk about, well, make sure that we are on the same page, so what a, what a cable is, first of all. Uh, by cable, I mean a tool for building real-time applications. So from one definition, we should go to another, because what, what is real-time application? What is real-time web? And we could check out the Wikipedia, and it's not so explanation. It's not a good explanation here, I think, because there are some updates, checks, periodically, what's it all about? I think uh, I try to explain it a little bit differently. So real-time communication, at the communication which, it's a just different type of communication, different from what? Uh, from what we have in almost, and I think in every web application, request response, kind of synchronous communication. And uh, request response communication uh, implies uh, the following. So in order to get some data from server, a client should send a request. So there is no way for a server to send a data client without a client requesting it. Yeah, by the way, anyone played this ping pong at uh, the first day after party? That was pretty fun. That's when I came up with the idea of this slide, actually. Uh, it's, it's really a request response, and server is not feeling good. Um, <laughs> well, real time. So this is not real time. This is request response cycle, typical. Real time is different, uh, and it differs in usually two things. Uh, first, the communication is bidirectional, so messages are passing both ways independently. And it's usually dealing with persistent connections. So it could be real persistence in terms of uh, you know, sockets or kind of uh, abstract persistence modeled by other transports. Another thing which should we care about as backend developers and most Ruby developers, uh, backend developers, I think, uh, is the difference, uh, sorry, it's lagging. Yeah, uh, it's the difference of how we handle this requests at our server side. So request response usually deals with request queue, first come, first serve, and uh, we have a limited number of simultaneous requests in our server, very limited usually, so it's kind of fixed, and we have a queue. And real time, the situation is totally different. We have a large number of concurrent requests, and we have to serve them all, but not all together, just like imagine there's what, a century ago, there was a dinner somewhere nearby, and there were a limited number of waiters. We still have a limited number of servers, but we have a lot of people to serve, and we kind of serve them at large scale simultaneously, but actually concurrently. That's a, an example of concurrent work. And uh, that's what, we do, what we're dealing with in real time, and what we need real time for. There are a lot of examples, and actually, nowadays, I don't know, raise your hand if your application you're working on right now using real time features, at least small. Yeah, about a half of the audience. And um, it's gonna be more and more every day, so it's kind of a modern technology. It's actually not so modern, but it's popular, and we need it uh, to make our user experience better in our applications. And when we're talking about real time, we usually talk about web sockets. We don't go, we're not going to talk about older techniques, uh, like long calling, comments, flash sockets. Probably anyone have tried it. Um, and we talking about, when we're talking about web sockets, we're talking about concurrency. And the thing is, the problem is actually, that concurrency and Ruby are things, uh, you know, not playing well together. Uh, that's, that's actually, <laughs> yeah, I'll give you a break. Uh, yeah, uh, well, the thing is, that's a kind, of a kind of a knowledge, a common knowledge in the community, so writing real-time applications in Ruby, well, it, 
it's, not, it's almost impossible. They're going to be less performant than applications in other languages, such as Erlang. And that's, well, after the, today's keynote, I think uh, my goal is to help you unlearn this knowledge and to, to, to just trying to convince you that uh, writing concurrent applications in Ruby is, could be tricky, but it's possible. So you can choose a Ruby pill instead of uh, switching to something else and building your another uh, microservice in some mainstream language. I'm not going to name it here. I don't want to. So that's kind of a, what we're gonna talk about. And uh, that's quickly about myself, just to oh, tell you any, something else about me. Usually I add this part in the beginning of the talk, but now I realize the title is not that clear, so we should be first got through the topic for the introduction. So my name is Vladimir. Um, it's not maybe so easy to pronounce here in the United States, so you can call me Vlad. It's a little bit easier. Oh, many people call me Pelkan using my GitHub and, uh, handle or Twitter handle, um, so I'm doing a lot of open source stuff, my own projects, I'm contributing to Rails. I uh, spent two and a half years trying to make action cable testing merge into Rails, and it's gonna be in Rails 6 finally. It should have been in Rails 5, but for some reason, you know, you can read the story here, it's a long story. <laughs> um, currently, I'm working as team lead uh, at a company called, um, uh, El uh, not Elvis Martians, sorry, but uh, Evil Martians. Elvis is everywhere we are in Los Angeles, you know. Every, every restaurant has its own Elvis here. It's so strange. And we're doing product development, and it's, it's called consultancy, actually, uh, for both big companies, small companies, and uh, there is a bonus. One of these companies is hiring, uh, and actually a company I'm working on right now. You can check the board of jobs here at the hallway if you want to kind of work with me, but not in, in, uh, as a part of Evil Martians, but as another company team. Uh, that's not interesting, actually. Uh, what's interesting is our open source work. Uh, so doing commercial development, we're trying to uh, kind of get, give back to the community as much as possible. So. We're trying to extract uh, some frameworks, some tools from our open, uh, commercial projects and make them open source. And I'm gonna talk about the open source tool today. A um, few more advertisements. So we get a blog where we're writing about what we're doing. And uh, yeah, uh, right now I live in Brooklyn. We have a multiple bases around the world. So in the United States and Russia. So I'm based in Brooklyn. If you're around and want to talk about Ruby cables, whatever, just ping me. Finally, we reach the point where we're going to start the talk. <clears throat> Just a second. Uh, we already covered an introduction. So we get two more. Oh, it's actually the title is meaningless. I'm just trying to outline what I'm going to talk about, but it's Action Cable, Rack, Ruby, everything. Let's really talk about everything uh, related to Ruby and other stuff. And I'd like to start with um, a particular example of cable, Action Cable. Uh, who's using Action Cable here? Anyone? Any, any, again, a lot, about a half of audience. That's great. Every year, more and more people use an Action Cable. The first time I gave a talk about cables, um, almost two years ago, and there were me, nobody else. Uh, it's actually, the situation is much better, so we're using cable. And that's why I'd like to talk about Action Cable, because it's the most popular cable in Ruby nowadays. And actually, I like it. I like the way it's designed. It's a good Rails framework from the API point of view, maybe. So from the, I mean, I mean framework design, not other parts. So just to remind you what Action Cable is, what it consists of, we have several parts of the framework. So first of all, Action Cable provides a server part. That's a part which is responsible for handling uh, web sockets. Uh, then we have a broadcaster part. Uh, the part is responsible for sending messages to clients. It implements publish subscribe pattern, so we do not send a message to a particular client directly. We use named channels called streams and action cable for some reason. And uh, to manage all the stuff in our application code, we use we have channels framework. So it's an abstraction to manipulate uh, WebSocket connections to give access to business logic for your clients. And actually, channel is something uh, like a controller for request response, but for WebSockets. So it plays the same role, but for persistent connections. 
what good about Action Cable is that it's really easy to build a working application in five minutes. It's, it's really good in it. So that's, yeah, five minutes and you have a chat working. Have you imagined this five years before, 10 years before? Probably not. And even nowadays, most people think that web sockets and that kind of stuff is difficult. It's, it's have never been easier with Action Cable. That's kind of an example of simple application, but uh, how can we use this application? How does it scale, maybe? You know, this year's RailsConf was focused on Rails scales, and Rails 6 scale, scalable by default, and actually, uh, there were nothing about Action Cable, so we likely cover this in this topic, because scaling Action Cable is hard. And uh, let me show you some, first of all, benchmarks. Uh, related to cables. So when we want to benchmark the cable, what we want to learn, what we want to measure? Uh, two things. Uh, first, uh, real-time characteristics. Uh, the real-time characteristics of cable is actually one of the characteristics as how fast it, it can broadcast data to clients. And uh, also we want to measure resources usage. That's a more crucial part. But let's start with the first one. Uh, for the first benchmark, uh, I used uh, Benchmark once conducted by Hash Rocket Company. It's called WebSocket Shootout. And let me explain this benchmark, what, what we measure by the example. Suppose that we have a live comments feature uh, on config site uh, for live streaming of RubyConf. And there are thousands of people watching Keynote, of course. And they want to publish comments and share their ideas. And uh, once one person is publishing comment, we want the server have to transmit this comment to everyone else connected client, right? And the time it takes server to do this job is actually what we want to measure during this benchmark. So it's like a latency of delivery. So to all the clients a message. And we want to make this time as less as possible because if you send a message 10 seconds after it was published, it's actually not a real time anymore. It doesn't relate to what's going on on the screen, for example. Um, let's, let's see the results. Uh, we compare Action Cable with uh, implementations in Golang and Erlang, very simple, doing the same thing, uh, the same functionality, but in different languages. And the thing about Action Cable is that, um, well, it doesn't work great. Uh, the more clients we have connected to the stream, the more, the more latency. It's almost linear uh, function here. And well, 10,000 clients, 10 second latency, not real time, right? Not good. Um, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't use Action Cable, so I could stop here talking and say, well, don't use it. No, that's a little bit more tricky. Of course you can use, it depends on your use case, and that's kind of a, I call it cable theorem. So with the Action Cable, you either use not crowded channels, I mean channels would have not that big number of subscribers, less, than, not, not dozens of thousands, so thousand, two, it's okay maybe, uh, but more, it's going to be low, uh, high latency. And if you don't care about latency, you can use Action Cable without any problem. Um, the second part of this chair is actually not so mm, positive, because never mind how you use it, uh, resources usage is going to be high. And it's about CPU usage. Hey. Yeah, that's kind of a, what uh, server monitoring looks like when you run running action cable and doing some stuff, uh, so kind of under pressure. And memory, so we're gonna focus on memory much more in this talk. So as you can see, for handling the same amount of active clients and uh, action cable Ruby solution, uh, we need much more memory than uh, using different uh, web service in different languages. But that's about uh, benchmarks. Yeah, right, and benchmarks, well, not the best way to evaluate the technology. We need some real time, real stories. And that's a story uh, I'd like to tell. Um, actually, this story is much more scary than benchmarks because um, the project called equip.com, it's a, how to say it? So it's a platform to, which provides live statistics and live translations for equestrian shows. That's a, Horses, sports, something like that. I'm not in this, and I don't understand it actually. So, and there are a lot of people watching that in Europe. So that's a Swedish project, and 10,000 people every weekend watch this kind of textual translations of these shows. And to handle this amount of people, um, the project used to have a 
more than 20 dynos on Heroku, it's 20 gigabytes of memory just to handle 10,000 clients, and they still experience problems. That's, well, that's much worse than I showed in Benchmark. Why? What's the problem? Why uh, the real life memory usage is even worse than we see in Benchmarks? Um, well, I tried to think about it, and did some investigation, I want to get through it, and tell you what was my suggestions. Well, first, let's talk about how uh, we implement WebSockets in Rack-based applications. Uh, so we have this thing called Rack Hijack. Mm -hmm. First, Rack. So Rack is the interface of every web application uses Rack. Rack is a common interface, which kind of a bridge between web server, which handles connections, all this HTTP stuff, and your application. It provides a format of input and output of data. And it was designed for request response uh, communication, so it's kind of synchronous. Um, I don't remember when exactly, probably about five, four years ago, there was a, there were a hack edit called Rack Hijacked, which allowed you to uh, kind of hijack an underlying IO object uh, socket and use it in your application, so, and manage it yourself, not within web server. And this trick helped us to build a, uh, WebSocket servers with, within Rack without needing to run in a separate process like we did before, for example. Uh, but that comes with the price. Uh, and it affects both our performance and our memory consumption. Because we have to run a separate IO loop to handle sockets, and we have to do all low-level stuff like parsing WebSocket protocol, for example, and and et cetera. So th there is different, definitely an overhead. Uh, let me come back for a minute. That's a quotation from the article of Bo, who is Bo. I want to introduce this person too, because he's doing great stuff. Uh, and who knows about this uh, to tools, Iodin and Plezi? Yeah, just one person, you know? Then uh, that's kind of strange, because these two actually probably is the future of Ruby uh, web servers. Iodin is a web server, so it's like Puma, but more efficient and more performant. And it has some great features for real time, its own protocol instead of rake hijack, which is much better because you don't have to handle any, any low level stuff in your code. And Plasic is just a web framework based on top of that. And if we run benchmarks, for example, for Iodin, our real time performance is almost the same as for Golang and uh, memory usage is also good. Uh, that's actually because Iodin is just a wrapper of a C++ framework for, for web, web framework. We didn't buy the same offer, actually. And um, the thing is that uh, the, the way Iodin handles uh, web sockets could be a standard in the future rec. There is also already a pull request which proposes this kind of interface uh, to rec. And it's implemented by Iodin servers and another server called I'm not sure about the pronunciation, maybe agu, it's a Japanese word for some kind of fish. It says, oh, I know, oh, oh, I know about this framework, sorry. I'm not familiar with it a lot. Um, the idea is to replace Rack Hijack with kind of Rack Upgrade, that's a work in progress title, which uh, also provide an access to kind of an abstract uh, IO object, not uh, directly to the socket, so you have to implement some callbacks and you can do real time, but all the low-level stuff uh, handled by a web server. And it could be much more efficient. Uh, and there is also a pull request to Rails to add support for this new work in progress REC API to Action Cable. And it's just like a proof of concept that this REC API works. I tried it and it turned out that it, well, it doesn't help here for some reason. Uh, hijack is not the biggest problem of the current implementation of Action Cable, actually. So we should investigate further. And the second thought was, uh, okay, we know that uh, with Action Cable, we have long-lived objects. Uh, every connection initiates a bunch of Ruby objects, actually almost a thousand of Ruby objects, which is almost 60 kilobyte of memory just to open a connection. It doesn't include uh, subscriptions, message passing, and all that kind of stuff. Well, what's wrong with long-lived objects? Uh, my hypothesis is that it causes heap fragmentation. Well, I tried to 
capture a heap dump once from a running action cable instance, and I was a little bit surprised. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, uh, how to explain? So every vertical line is a page of memory allocated by Ruby. So red dots is an occupied memory, so there are li 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 uh, live object here, and blank, uh, spaces are unoccupied memory. What we see here, what is fragmentation? Fragmentation and we, oh, well, sorry. Uh, fragmentation is a, is a phenomenon when we have a lot of allocated memory but it's actually not used uh, efficiently. And we have this strange blank lines. Probably that was uh, connection avalanches and clients disconnected somewhere later and we left with these empty spaces. Um, that's probably, a problem, and uh, we know there is some work is going on to solve this problem. But yeah, this particular snapshot shows that we waste about 60% of memory just for nothing. So we started talking about future improvements on Ruby, and let's talk about it a little bit more. Uh, I had a discussion in the, the complete guide to Rails performance Slack. It's a very good community. There was a lot of people involved focused on performance, and uh, Nate, uh, the author of the book, asked me, well, what do you think about Ruby Free? Uh, would it be useful for Action Cable, for example? And that's so it's an interesting question, which turned out to be part of the stoke, the answer for this question. Uh, one thing here, yeah, don't have to read this. I will repeat it in slides more in a better way. But uh, one thing mentioned here, which relates to the previous uh, slides when we, uh, we saw heap fragmentation is generational hypothesis. Uh, that's a hypothesis that's pretty common for languages, runtimes run with generational garbage collection. It states that most of objects die young and uh, do not survive uh, many garbage collection cycles. And the thing is that if objects survive a lot of garbage collection cycles, it moved into another part of heap which collected more often. And long-lived objects is, ob, ob, uh, is uh, kind of a excluder from this rule. They do, they do survive a lot of uh, cycles, but they finally collect it. And the space they uh, been allocated is not freed immediately. So we have to wait a full cycle. So that's kind of an, well, I'm not the person who's very, very good at GC, but I think that's somewhere here is the truth to why we have this problem. And as I already stated, uh, yeah, compacting GC, if it's gonna be part of Ruby free, will be really helpful for this kind of applications where we have long-lived objects. Another thing you're probably thinking about, okay, we're gonna have builds, guilds, and guilds are great. It's like a core root and go, right? Spoiler or not. Uh, uh, let's revise what we have right now. So we had threads and we have fibers. Um, the first question is, uh, what the hell is fiber? Uh, don't, who use fibers? Anyone? <laughs> yeah, okay, a little bit more people than people who know what iodine is, that's interesting. Um, how to explain what fiber is? Well, if you know what thread is, so it's threads allowed to uh, run Ruby code concurrently and it's al it provides automatically, automatical switching between threads, so you don't care have to care about how, when to switch between your execution between threads. Ruby cares about it, and Fiber doesn't have this thing. You have to do everything manu manually. So Fiber is like a very, very simple abstraction for doing concurrency. Um, and actually, I, thread is, uh, includes, kind, kind of includes Fiber. For every thread, there is an internal Fiber. What we want to know about Fibers and threads that to allocate, to start a new thread, we need to allocate a stack for that. And the size of the stack for now uh, is fixed. And it's one megabyte for thread and 128 kilobytes for fiber. And uh, what is guild in this uh, picture? Guild is a next level to the left from here. So it's kind of, it contains a thread and fiber. Well, actually, we don't care about fibers right now uh, too much. But if we want to use guilds as as the same way as coroutines and Erlang processes used for real time, 
and they used uh, the way that for every connection, WebSocket connection, we just spawn an Erlang process or we run a Go routine, usually. That's the way this implemented in existing frameworks. S running a guild for connection means that we need to locate one megabyte of RAM just for one connection, and it's, it won't be helpful for memory, uh, from the perspective of memory usage for our real-time application. So, and actually guilds are not about concurrency. Guilds for parallelism, they kind of replace, gonna replace processes. We don't need to fork processes, we can use guilds and um, uh, utilize all the cores available on the machine. That's actually what guilds are good for, but not for concurrency. Good news that, uh, okay, let's skip this. Dynamic stretch exercise is very early work. I'm not sure it's gonna be ready free by free, but that could help. Another good thing is Fred Lab. It's something in between threads and fibers. I'm not sure about the stack size for thread lets. I think it should be the same as for, thread, for fibers, so it's pretty small, much smaller than thread. And what's the difference between thread let, thread, and fiber? So I said it's something in between, so it, as it positioned here. Uh, thread let is a fiber, but it automatically switches on I.O. operations. So when reading from socket, right into socket. So it's a semi-automatic fiber. Actually, the second name for thread let is auto fiber. I'm not sure what's gonna be a final name. There is a uh, feature request in Ruby Bug Tracker. You can check it and follow. And the combination of all these four things, guilds to replace processes, thus uh, also save a bunch of memory, and thread lets to handle concurrency, and of course, compact in GC, will definitely improve the performance of real-time applications in Ruby. That's, well, we would, we would likely have to rewrite everything using these new things, but uh, eventually we'll have a really good performance. And somewhere in 2020, maybe, two years later from this day, well, I don't know, are you going to wait or not? Let's take a break and think about it a little bit. So, um, I'm thinking what are I going to talk about this, uh, this slide. Mm, yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> now, now I'm ready. Um, so far we talked about how we can improve Ruby to compete with, kind of compete, to be as performant as other technologies. But the question is, do we need to do that? Uh, Ruby is non-exclusive language, right? So we can use Ruby with other languages, or even better, we can make other languages serve our needs. Why not, right? So why should we care about performance where there are already performant languages, we just have to learn how to use them uh, with Ruby to kind of uh, have the must of our code base to write code in Ruby application code, but still uh, run performant applications. And that's uh, the last part of the talk. Oh, we have a lot of time for that, cool. Uh, it's going to be about, and it's a project called AnyCable. And it's actually an implementation of this kind of philosophy do not replace Ruby with anything, but combine, make some kind of hybrid uh, applications. Um, oh, what the hell? <clears throat> so what is action cable, any cable? Um, any cable is a project, well it's not a jam, a library, because it's a collection of different libraries and services, and uh, how it's called, tools. Uh, that, you that allows you to use uh, kind of, uh, logic class servers written in different languages to handle all the hard work and keep all the interesting work, your application code in Ruby. And if you rem remember, if you remember the parts of action cable, so we have server, broadcaster, channels, clients. Uh, the thing is, the, pro the problematic part here is this server. It's a the weakest part of our stack. So we can move it somewhere, and uh, the somewhere is called, well, here, any cable. So any cable is responsible for connecting uh, a server to your application, and it looks like this. You have a separate instance, separate WebSocket server, which handles all the connections and serve WebSocket clients. You still have your Rails or Ruby application, which serve request response, things, and this to connect it somehow to each other because you want to access your business logic from 
here, your channels, your, why, why do you need this? So, for example, to implement uh, authentication stuff, authorization, you can build a WebSocket RPC or replace your controllers with WebSockets, why not? There are some projects. Or, I don't know, render asynchronously parts of views. And a lot of use cases why you want to have an access to your Ruby code, to your Ruby application, and to keep all the business logic in one place and not to du duplicate it between different services. So it's not about microservice architecture, actually. WebSocket server is not microservice, it's just a proxy, like uh, Nginx for HTTP, for example, if you serve assets for it. That's the same role here. The question is how to manage this communication. Uh, when I first started working on this project, I was thinking about building my own protocol on top of TCP, maybe some binary protocols for messages, and I've never ended up here, I think, if I decided to do that. So I took a thing that already was built, and good thing it was built in Google, uh, though they do not uh, tell that G is for Google, it's for something else, okay. Uh, and it's really good uh, framework. Uh, so it's a universal RPC framework. What does it mean uh, by universal? It means that you can write clients and servers in different languages using a definition file. So it's, you actually auto-generate this client and services, and they communicate which is, with each other. So it's really good um, technology. And uh, from technical point of view, it's just HTTP to combined with protobuf for data serialization. Um, all you need is, as I already told, a definition file which describes your service, uh, run a script using Google gRPC build tools, and you have a library which works with this uh, server or client. That's a good thing. So the final diagram looks a little bit more complicated. Yeah, it's not as simple as Action Cable from the infrastructure point of view because you have to run uh, at least three processes, one for handling RPC, one for handling web circuits, and still you have to run this, your usual Rails application or Ruby application to handle HTTP requests. But uh, the value we, we get, get with this uh, little bit complex infrastructure is really good. So let's talk about benchmarks again, right? Uh, so WebSocket servers. Um, there are Two implementations of WebSocket servers, ex servers exist for any cable, so any cable compatible WebSocket servers. Uh, any cable Go, written in Go, well, and early cable written in Erlang. The second one is kind of my playground for experiments, so it's, nobody except me use it <laughs> because I don't think anyone wants to use Erlang for some reason. Everyone afraid of Erlang. So any cable Go, that's your choice if you want to try. Um, Benchmarks, well, no, no, no surprises here. Uh, the performance of any cable Go is like almost the same as performance of very simple Go uh, application, and the memory usage is really good. Um, well, that's, that's just uh, data you can share. Um, CPU usage is beautiful. I like this slide because we can compare how Erlang Shadow and Golang Shadow differs. If you check this here, that Erlang is really, really uniformly distributed uh, CPU usage, while Golang is, has some artifacts. That's a kind of a conclusion that Erlang virtual machine is still the best in the world of concurrency, but, well, Golang is not that bad, too. And com coming back to the real-life example uh, about this project. So, after suffering with Action Cable and a lot of dinos, the, I helped them to switch to any cable. It actually was pretty easy. And the number of uh, dinos decreased by five, and the number of gigabytes decreased by 10, the same as number of bucks per month. That's, well, pretty good, I think, uh, for the small project like this. And that's a real life example. Uh, why any cable is so efficient? So, why we do not have memory issues, except from handling most of the hard work in, in this case, uh, Golang application. Um, another thing which differs any cable from action cable. We do not have long-lived objects. Yeah, we do have a Ruby part. And uh, that's a very interesting part, actually, because from the action cable point of view, so it connects to action cable, you don't have to write anything else. You use the same channels as with action cable. 
and we make action cable think that it works with real sockets, but actually these are not sockets. There's a temporary objects which quacks like sockets, so it's a Ruby type, type, type typing in action. And um, that could be a little tricky, but it works, and it surprisingly works very good. Uh, another question which many people asked me, uh, is there this connection between WebSocket server and RPC server through HTTP2 and, and not a bottleneck or bottleneck? How, how performant it is? It turns out that it's very performant, so uh, no operation of RPC, I mean that just a server doing nothing, so just playing Ruby RPC server, just accepting something and responding with a predefined response is doing more than 5,000 requests per second. This is pretty good. Uh, any cable is twice slower because we have to deal with all this quacking stuff, initialize object and do these things. Um, but I'm not sure is it realistic to hit the limit, actually. So 2,000 requests per second is a lot. But if you want to hit the limit, we have an option for you. I'm not gonna talk about here about it here a lot because it's very technical, but just uh, let me tell you the, about the idea. Um, it's not clear from this slide, unfortunately. The, the idea is the following. Uh, most of the channel's actions, so, uh, subscribed uh, callbacks and performed actions, are um, kind of logical. So you're streaming from channel, you're doing some broadcasting. You don't have to touch your database, for example, or as other parts of your application code. So the logic lives behind the channel. So maybe we can execute this within a Golang application, not without doing RPC calls. And yes, we can. And here is where MRuby comes into the stage. Uh, we can embed MRuby not only into smaller devices. Actually, we can embed MRuby into other languages, such as Golang. And the idea is to grab this simple channels from Ruby application, compile them into mRuby and execute within Golang service. So I call it mRuby cache. So it's not actually cache, maybe it's inlining, better name for that. And that's, we can avoid calling RPC at all. That could be very effective if you have a latency between your WebSocket server and RPC server. You don't have to run them on the same machine. If you run them on the same machine, that doesn't make sense. If you run them in some quiet environment and you don't know how the network is looking, how it operates, that makes sense. The work's still in progress. Uh, actually, I wanted to release it, but when I was running benchmarks, I got some segmentation faults, so I have to investigate. Uh, and Ruby is actually C, so I have to learn it a little bit more. So you can check the talk. There are some examples on how to use Golang with mRuby too. It could be interesting. Um, a little bit more about any cable. So despite from being complex from infrastructure point of view, it's really easy from Ruby point of view. You actually just add in a jam, configure in a uh, subscription adapter in your any cable action cable config, and run a few services. Yeah, you need to run at least three or maybe two if you use some hacks, but um, we think that it should be used only in production because it's compatible with action cable and you can still use it for development. We have some tricks um, to ensure that it's compatible because not every function is supported, not every functionality is supported. We have compatibility checks, runtime checks, Rubicop cops. You can make sure that your code would run the same way, will run the same way in any cable. And we have as a side effect, actually, of using a separate WebSocket servers, uh, we have some interesting features. One of these features is zero disconnect deployment. What happens when you redeploy, redeploy your code with action cable? You have to disconnect all the connected clients because you have to reload the server, the complete server. You can't well, just avoid this. And if you have a, lot of, a large number of connections, and you disconnect them all at once, they try to connect all at once, and you, in the effect of such code, uh, when we discussed this with DHH, she told me they had this problem in Basecamp and they called it connection avalanche. Because uh, when multiple connections try to connect, there is still a request queue to serve the clients, there is some maybe race conditions, 
So it could just kill your server. And surprisingly, any cable solved this issue. It was not intentional, but uh, we just can't do this. Since WebSocket server is logicless, it doesn't contain any application logic. It's just proxy. You don't have to restart it on every uh, deployment. Otherwise, you can add a load balancer, yeah, such as Envoy, which supports gRPC. And if you have at least two RPC instances, and you can implement rolling update, yeah, a lot of DevOps work maybe. Uh, we plan to release our Helm charts for Kubernetes soon. We're using it on Kubernetes actually. Um, you can have disconnectless deployments. Your clients shouldn't disconnect. There is a problem arise. What if you want to change uh, some kind of structure of your identifier, so some, some lar major updates? You have to disconnect clients anyway. But, uh, well, in most cases, you shouldn't. Another side effect uh, that we uh, added a comprehensive analytics support and instrumentation to any cable so we can finally know how many clients do we have, how many messages do they send, and a lot of other useful stuff, stuff to monitor the issues, failures, and whatever. That's our dashboard. Not so many clients, sorry. Um, and another thing, it's Rails-free, actually. So you don't have to use it with Rails. You can use it with other frameworks um, to use the same channels framework. Uh, we have a light cable. It's a Rails-free action cable implementation, actually dependency-free. So it doesn't have all the features, but most of the features, and you can use it with just plain REC application and connect any cable. Um, and yeah, some, something new. Uh, have you heard about GraphQL and its subscription? Super feature. Uh, which doesn't work well for some reason. Uh, you can check uh, an issue in any cable, GitHub repo, there is an issue related to GraphQL subscription where the colleague of mine uh, explains what's wrong with GraphQL implementation and after explaining that he built a better implementation compatible with any cable and we use it right now in production and it's good. So that's something new from us here. Um, yeah, we're out of time and I'm actually finishing the talk, so the new release has been today. I'm a conference-driven development, so I'm trying to release something for uh, every new conference that motivates me to work on open source because it's hard, <laughs> actually. Um, I also built a beautiful site with documentation, a lot of useful stuff here. And yeah, we're announcing, but probably clear that actually any cable is built on little Martians, you can hire us to build your real-time solution. But we've decided to make it more clear and edit this page called Any Cable Pro. Actually, no pro versions, we're just providing a support uh, or help you in any other way if you want. Uh, actually, one more slide just to summarize, probably your regards idea, so real-time with Ruby is possible. And for now, we should enhance our Ruby with something else, uh, either and all C++ based uh, web servers or other languages, bridges, whatever stuff, cables. And Ruby free, we're all waiting for it. Uh, I hope any cable will become useless, unfortunately not. Uh, so thank you, I still have a, some stickers and let's go to listen much.